At a time when America was rising to unprecedented wealth and power, John D. Rockefeller became the richest man to have ever lived. He rose from poverty to create one of, if not the largest and most successful corporations of all time. In the end, he gave away more money to charity than nearly anybody else who had ever lived. However, he was also one of the greatest villains of his time, and to much of the public, a monster responsible for much of the misery that millions were living through. So how did Rockefeller and others like him rise to such great heights during the Gilded Age, but seem to keep others down so low? Well, that's the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. This is a political cartoon depicting the Standard Oil Trust in a way that many Americans view the corporation that John D. Rockefeller ran. The company here is depicted as an octopus with an oil tank head that has its menacing tentacles around the Capitol building, boats, oil wells, and politicians squirming under its grasp, and his eyes dead set on the White House. Clearly, this cartoon is depicting the Standard Oil Company as a monstrous corporation that is set upon controlling America. And we're going to be getting into why that would be and how Rockefeller's company, Standard Oil, and many other companies grew to dominate America's economy at this time, and the good, the bad, and the ugly all along the way in today's story lecture. But before we go any further, our exploration question for today's story lecture is, how are corporations like Standard Oil able to rise to such dominance during the Gilded Age? And was it a benefit or a detriment to America? And to answer that, we got to take our umbrellas out because I got some history to rain upon you first. In the years after the Civil War, starting in the late 1860s, America experienced a massive economic boom and rapidly industrialized, which is the switch from man or animal to machine-powered production. Now, this process began much earlier, but it really skyrocketed between 1860 and 1900. And this period became known as the Gilded Age. The term was coined by Mark Twain, referring to how things appeared to be great with economic growth and material wealth, but underneath the time was rotten and corrupt. Previously, most Americans were connected to their local markets and their nearby communities, but then a national market developed thanks mostly to railroads. In 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. It was the world's very first and amazing accomplishment that unified the country from east to west for the first time, and a golden spike was used to join the two railroads that met in Utah. By 1900, over 190,000 miles of rail were laid, more than double the rest of Europe and the world combined. All these railroads helped to boost the economy as well by making the shipment of goods and resources far cheaper, while also employing millions of people in the process. Industrialization also led to other innovations like the telephone and light bulb, electricity, motion pictures, improved means of making steel, and the discovery of oil. And when the first well of crude oil was drilled in America in 1859 in Pennsylvania, it set off an oil rush, and a young John D. Rockefeller was paying close attention and was ready to strike when the crude was black. Now, John D. Rockefeller was born in New York and was one of six children raised by his single mom. His father was a con man and was always on the move. When he did come home, he enjoyed conning John and his siblings too, hoping it would sharpen them up and teach them valuable lessons. But probably the best thing it taught him was to not be anything like him, and he followed much more closely in his mother's footsteps. From a young age, he worked to help his mother by raising turkeys in the backyard and selling their meat. Growing up so tight on money led him to be ruthlessly efficient in business later in life and cut costs at every corner. He got his first job making 50 cents a day and being a strict Christian, even then he was donating some of his earnings to the church and to charities. He held a number of jobs and was always moving up the ladder. But as he watched the oil industry grow and the nation industrializing, he turned his total attention to turning that black crude into green and gold. And he sold off all his other assets and went all in on refining oil. He opened his first refinery, turning oil to usable kerosene in Cleveland, Ohio. Saving money to the point where he was nearly mad, he looked for other ways to use the waste that was left over from making kerosene. While other producers just dumped it and sometimes into the rivers and oceans, Rockefeller learned to sell it, making things like petroleum jelly and tar for roads. Better for the environment, better for his wallet. Then in 1870, he formed the Standard Oil Company. In just four months in what became known as the Cleveland Massacre, Standard Oil took out 22 of his 26 competitors in the city, and he then set his sights across the rest of the country. 
but he was not the only one rising to such great heights during this time. The industrial economy was leading to the rise of industrial giants all across America. You see, industrialization is almost synonymous with the rise of mega corporations and big businesses. Previously, most people worked on farms or for small mom and pop stores or in small factories, but those were soon gobbled up by big business. One way they did this was through vertical integration. Vertical integration was when one company owned everything they needed to produce and sell their product. This cut out the middleman so they didn't have to pay any other companies along the way. Andrew Carnegie was the first to really master vertical integration. Though he started as a child laborer in a clothing factory making just pennies an hour, he worked his way all the way up the steel industry by using a new and more efficient way to make steel called the Bessemer process. Carnegie eventually controlled 60% of America's steel industry. Vertically integrating meant he owned the iron and coke mines, the ships, and all the rails that brought those materials to the mills that made the steel. He later sold his company for almost half a billion dollars and became the richest man in the world at the time. However, other industrialists followed the technique that was first mastered by Rockefeller called horizontal integration. This simply meant that you bought out or controlled all your competitors so you had a virtual monopoly on the product. And without real competition in the market, it would give you an unfair advantage over these companies. Similar to a monopoly, companies would form trusts where they would pretty much control their competitors and work together to act as a monopoly, but it at least gave the illusion of competition. But trust me, there wasn't. The sugar, wheat, nails, railroad, and even meat industries were controlled by trusts that swept away thousands of small shops and businesses in the process. And that brings us to Dad Jokes in History. So Standard Oil's competitors have been calling 911 about his business practices. Oh yeah? Yeah, but they can't help because they're monopolies. And we're back. So remember, America was always seen as the land of the free, where the people fought against any attempt by the government to control, abuse, or infringe on their freedoms. But soon these companies became so large and so powerful that in many ways they had much more power over the average person's life than the government did. It's one of the reasons that men like Thomas Jefferson feared industrialization. And as these industrial giants grew, none of them appeared as evil or threatening as Standard Oil, and not even the government could cut them down. Now, on his way to dominance and monopoly, Rockefeller did many honest and noble things to grow his business and help millions of Americans get access to cheap and high quality fuel. Being such a large business, he could hire the best engineers and chemists to improve refining, transportation, and the digging of wells. Standard Oil was always cutting waste and improving efficiency, which greatly lowered the cost of fuel. However, he was also ruthless to those who wouldn't fold under his pressure. The unofficial model for Standard Oil was, let us pray, as in preying upon their competitors. Even Carnegie referred to him as Rockefeller. Standard Oil employed spies and would famously bribe and pressure railroads to ensure that he got the lowest rates, which often meant that smaller companies and farmers paid far higher rates than he did. So it was both through great business strategies and unmerciful tactics that led him to monopolize the oil industry. And big business owners like himself could justify this in a number of ways. Firstly, he absolutely believed he was helping the country by providing cheap and improved fuel. And then there was this idea called social Darwinism. Social Darwinism argued that the wealthy deserved their riches since they worked hard for it and were successful. And the poor, well, deserved their poverty. Applying Charles Darwin's theory of evolution incorrectly to society, they believed that society best functioned when the successful could reap all the rewards of their efforts and that the poor and less fortunate shouldn't be helped since it was rewarding failure or laziness. And the government at this time had a laissez-faire approach to the economy, which meant that the government did not really get involved at all. There were no minimum wage laws, protections on workers' safety, or maximum work hours in a week. This left the companies to really treat the workers as they saw fit. And if the workers didn't like it, well, there were hundreds of thousands of others who were desperate for a job. And the struggle for workers' rights is the focus of our next episode, so make sure to check that out. So, following social Darwinist theories and benefiting from laissez-faire, Standard Oil became the wealthiest company in the world. When John D. Rockefeller retired, he had surpassed Carnegie and was the richest man in America and probably to have ever lived until Jeff Bezos took the throne. 
He spent the rest of his life, like Carnegie though, devoted to philanthropy and giving away much of his fortune. He gave millions to the medical field, helping to eradicate yellow fever and hookworm in America. He provided major funding for universities, including an all-black women's college in Atlanta, Georgia. He eventually gave away $550 million, more money than almost anyone had ever owned in human history. Standard Oil, though, was eventually broken up in 1911 for being a monopoly into 34 different companies to allow for greater competition in the market. Over time, though, these companies consolidated again and today are some of the most profitable businesses in the world. ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP, and others. You know, Mark Twain said that history never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. So does this sound familiar? <laughs> Thanks for engaging in some history today. This has been History for Humans. Hey, thanks so much for watching. And if you liked the episode, could you click the thumb that looks like this and show it? And you can hit the subscribe button as well. And for teachers and homeschool parents, you can go over to my website, historyforhumans.com. And we have lesson plans and resources that go with all of my episodes. So you can save yourself time and energy and stress and just enjoy exploring history with your students. And if you're doing a learning activity found on my website, hang out because we got instructions in just a sec. Okay, today's lesson, guys, is a great one. You're gonna read two secondary sources, meaning that they were created after the fact and not from the time period like primary sources. And they offer two different points of view on the rise of big businesses and trusts like Standard Oil. One sees the industrial leaders like Rockefeller and Carnegie as captains of industry, great men who did great things, while the other argues against them that they were robber barons that had terrible impacts on the country. So you're gonna read through them closely and you're first gonna fill out a team chart to gather your evidence related to their arguments. Try to sum it up in your own words and then you're going to pretend that you were a newspaper columnist in the 1880s. And what you're going to have to write about is your thoughts on the rise of big businesses and if you think the Standard Oil Trust should be broken up because it's detrimental for the country or kept in place because of its positive impacts. So think deeply, consider carefully, and write powerfully. You got this, now rock this.